I'm delighted to welcome you um, to this session in uh, our seminar series on ethical issues in organ transplantation. Um, the, the speaker today is going to be Mike Millis, um, uh, who will be talking about ethical issues in transplantation in China. A as many of you know, um, Mike is a professor of surgery, the director of the transplant center here, um, and also the medical director of transplantation services at the university. Um, he trained um, in medical school at Tennessee and residency and fellowship at UCLA. Um, his research in recent years has been closely related to health policy and ethics, uh, particularly working um, with the vice minister of health of China, uh, Jay Fu Wang, himself a, a transplant surgeon, um, to try to modify and change um, transplantation policies in China. I, I think that will be uh, the topic that Mike is going to discuss today. It's wonderful to welcome you, um, a member of the American College of Surgeons, American Society of Transplant Surgeons, et cetera. Michael, welcome. It's a, a great honor to, uh, to be asked to, to speak in the, in the faculty series um, following such great talks that we've had um, all this year. And uh, hopefully this will live up to the standard and uh, the rest of the talks uh, from uh, the rest of our speakers for the, for the rest of the year will uh, be similarly as good as at least our past ones. So um, <clears throat> um, with that, uh, as Mark said, I've uh, over the last several years worked very closely with the, the Vice Minister of Health in China to enact uh, some reforms that have uh, improved uh, transplanta the field of transplantation in China. And I'll be talking about that. I, I have to obviously start off with a conflict of interest statement. And um, I don't think I have any conflict of interests. Um, the work that I've done has been supported by a grant from the China Medical Board, which is to improve the practice and policy of transplantation in China. It was originally funded in 07 and renewed in 11. Um, wh when people find out that I'm a transplant surgeon and that I, I do work in China, the first thing that people ask me is, oh, so, so do you go over and do transplants in China? And um, I quickly respond that, that I do not. And um, I, I mention this at the conflict of interest uh, slide because frequently that uh, those activities have been associated with uh, a high uh, compensation for those surgeons who have gone to other countries and done transplants like this. And so I can assure you I have never done a transplant in China, uh, much less gotten any money from doing them in China if I were to go. Um, so, so then the, the, the follow-up question is then, well, what do you do? And um, so I had a hard time answering that uh, up until uh, the McLean Fellows Conference when Peter Singer introduced me, at least, to the term of uh, social entrepreneur. And uh, I think that, it, that really does describe what, I, what I'm trying to do. And uh, this is a picture of Bill Drayton, who is a uh, founder of, uh, of an organization that, that funds and supports social entrepreneurs. And in the, the quote, it says that social entrepreneurs are not content to just give a fish or to teach how to fish. They will not rest until they have revolution, revolutionized the fishing industry. And so putting that into what, what I do in China, my goal is not to just do a transplant or to teach the Chinese how to perform transplants, but to revolutionize the transplant system. And um, so we'll kind of use that as the benchmark of, of what I'm trying to do and uh, how successful I may have been or uh, not have been, as, as uh, your opinion uh, may vary on that. <clears throat> so the first thing we have to really discuss is, is why does transplant need policies and regulations? Um, we certainly know that if m many of the physicians in this, in this room were uh, in their lab and um, working on their research and had developed a small molecule that they wanted to try to test in, in humans, uh, they would have to go through a rigorous FDA uh, approval process in order to do the clinical trials, much less than get approval to do them. However, if a surgeon develops an operation either in his lab or even in his mind um, and wants to try it on a patient, probably at most, 
uh, he needs an IRB approval, uh, an informed consent for that. Um, so surgery is remarkably absent uh, of regulatory oversight. That the surgeon-patient relationship is one of the most sacred in, in medicine. We have uh, individualized pre-op planning of unique operations and intraoperative decisions that we cannot uh, discuss with the patient. And so uh, the care between a surgeon and a patient is very personalized and, and very much lacking of regulation. So um, in general, in the hospital, if you just take it out to the hospital, non-transplant medical care, there's, there's regulation on general hospital care, drugs, diagnostics, things like that, that the FDA and JCAH, et cetera, goes through. But regulation is absent on process, uh, priorities, resource allocation, et cetera. So if, if, a, pa if a patient with a pancreatic cancer uh, with a minimal chance of survival uh, really wants a Whipple operation, then uh, as long as the risks and benefits are, 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 are described to the patient, then uh, more than likely that patient will, will receive, a trans uh, receive the operation. Um, but transplant surgeons uh, are, are by their nature conflicted. Um, in our practice. We have uh, the care of the patient and uh, the care of the potential donor um, simultaneously. And so regulations uh, must be provided. And uh, for transplant care, regulation, in fact, drives all processes, priorities, allocation decisions, and quality assessments. It's, it's, it's not just up to the doctor and the patient. So. Um, this is obviously Michelangelo's depiction of the gift of life from God to man. Sandy, I think that's right, your husband, the art history. Is Sandy here? Uh, oh, she's not here today. Okay. Um, I'm certainly no Mike Michelangelo in terms of art. I was able to connect this mother and her daughter through the gift of an organ. And um, this is indeed why we have to, transplantation is different and why we have to be concerned both about the donor and the recipient. And in fact, I, I say that transplantation and the, the regulatory aspects that we deal with the most is because of the concern for that third party, for that donor. And we have to protect the rights and concerns of that donor before and after donation, and that's whether they are a living donor or a deceased donor. We have to protect their gift, and that drives much of the regulation on the recipient side. Patient selection is part of the decision-making process, uh, is determined if the recipient will be able to take care of the graft. The program quality, if, the, if we don't have guidelines for the, for the quality aspects of the program, then the gift will be wasted as well. And, and once the, the aspect of an equitable allocation system we know is, is part and parcel to a, a society that will support uh, organ donation in the long term. So uh, now we, we change a little bit, hopefully having provided you uh, the background and reasons why transplantation has to be regulated. And we can see, in fact, that when transplantation grows up in an unregulated fashion as it did in China, there are many abuses and problems. And <clears throat> um, these were finally started to be addressed in 06 um, by Jai Fu at a WHO conference in 2006, in which uh, the first public and then subsequently scientific recognition of the problems of transplantation in China occurred. The press focused, of course, on the organs from executed prisoners, of which is certainly a problem, but there were also many other problems. Quality, lack of a database, lack of transparency at every level, transplant tourism, and payment of organs were in fact just a few of the additional problems that needed to be addressed in order to try to clean up the transplant system in China. So um, the bottom line in China, having transplantation grown up in a non-regulated fashion, were that patients who needed transplants were getting harmed, living donors were being harmed, transplantation's reputation worldwide was being harmed. Patients were not receiving maximal benefits from uh, their transplant because of physician uh, compensation systems and feudal transplants were performed just in order to get the compensation. Participants were not provided adequate uh, informed consent, either on the donor, the recipient, or the payer. There was no transparency. 
Centers had exclusive relationships with prisons, and centers could do whatever they wanted to with the organ, eliminating any appearance of equity. And uh, there was also uh, concerns that that the need for organs would drive executions, or at least the time of the uh, of the execution. Um, and if if at least at that level, if not at potentially even at the judicial level of someone being paid off to, uh, a judge being paid off to sentence um, someone to death in order to uh, receive ultimately the organs from, from that person. So um, the, this is, um, so now we're, we're kind of switching now to what, we, what uh, we're, we've gotten to in 2012 and um, and recognition by China and, and Jaifu, both in April and May at two different uh, uh, talks, that the uh, reliance on deceased uh, donors, organs from executed prisoners, uh, will stop. And that um, the reason for that is that the death row inmates, um, in his words, may feel oppressed to become a donor. So transplant tourism uh, was driv is driven by profits. Some hospitals uh, trade with illegal organ agencies and, and forged identifications in order to sell organs to foreigners. Transplant tour tourism has made the sale of organs even more lucrative. And unfortunately, this, this practice continues in China, although regulation uh, has been established to, uh, to ban uh, transplant tourism. And that, that really refer, you know, it, uh, talks about uh, the, the lack of the rule of law overall in China, and not just within transplant or, or healthcare in general. Uh, if you talk to, to enough people uh, from China and who know about China, the whole uh, rule of law aspect uh, and, and pushing down regulations uh, to the individual level um, is frequently a problem. But um, the commercialization of transplant services uh, with organ trafficking and agencies is a, is a huge problem and it violates the principles of equity and the goal of establishing a harmonious society. So, uh, so one of the things that we've seen with, our regu with the regulations is a, a dramatic a decrease in the number of transplants performed. You see the, 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 the curve uh, of, of uh, transplants going up and it really peaked in, in 04. Um, and then soon after that, in 06, is when the the regulation started, and you, you're seeing a, a drop. And uh, today, it, well, the most recent data that we have, 2010, it's essentially at the same level as, as this for kidneys and this for liver. So one could certainly say that uh, we haven't been successful in terms of uh, providing transplant services uh, to those Chinese who need it. And um, I think that we would all have to agree that that is true. And, but um, the issue is, is that we have to go through a period of time in which uh, uh, in, in, to get into a more ethical scenario and a sustainable ethical scenario that fewer transplants are being performed. And ultimately, the, the greater good of a better system that ultimately will provide more, more organs for, for China will be developed. You know, even uh, at the most extreme estimates of, of the number of executed prisoners that, that have been postulated out there, um, there's no way that that number, even if they were able to use all of them as organ donors, would be able to satisfy the demand. And uh, a citizen-based system would be much more likely to uh, 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 get to uh, a closer uh, scenario of uh, demand and supply. So if we look at the world uh, ac uh, activity in organ transplantation, those are the numbers. Uh, China does a, approximately 10% uh, of those. And those are the, uh, the numbers there um, for each organ, with uh, kidney a little lower um, than, you know, and liver at 9.9%, at and heart and lung uh, in very small amounts. So once again, in, in 06, uh, if we go back to, to that point in time, we had uh, over 95% of the donors were from executed prisoners. Transplant tourism was widespread. There were over 600 hospitals performing transplants, and then there were no regulations. Uh, the vice minister called all the programs that were um, 
they were operating at that time to Guangzhou for a meeting in which uh, all the transplant centers were notified that they must uh, apply to the Ministry of Health in order to continue to perform uh, transplants in general. And, and they, had, they provided the, the uh, criteria in which programs would be judged. Uh, and they are very similar, in fact, to FDA and UNOS regulations regarding transplant centers as well. Experience of the primary surgeon, the center volume, institutional support, and the field strength of the institution in order to be able to provide transplant services. And on the donor side, that the, there was regulations that the prisoners and or the uh, and or the prisoner's family must sign the consent. There were four principal areas of focus: regulating quality, regulating transplantable organs, regulating transplant tourism, and regulating the source and rights of the organ donor. So in, in 06, uh, the interim provisions on the clinical application and management of human organ transplantation was, uh, was promulgated from the Ministry of Health, and that those, those once again now codified those, uh, those uh, areas of, of criteria of ethics, medical and surgical ex expertise, uh, ICU care, et cetera. And um, in o April of 06, the Committee of Organ Transplantation was established. And in November of 06, a national summit uh, was to announce uh, all, the, all these changes. This is the, um, the regulation that came out in, in uh, 07 that uh, from the, uh, the state council and then uh, the decree, which was adopted uh, by the, the legislature. So this, uh, these, the, the impact of these regulations decreased the number of transplant centers from over 600 to 161. Um, they had 18 months to com fully comply with the Ministry of Health regulations. And uh, currently, there are 161 fully approved Ministry of Health uh, cent uh, transplant centers. There were applications that were turned down because uh, they didn't want to increase that number. And they were still reviewing the first group. All provinces in China have at least one transplant center. So I go through the, the liver regulations just as a, a uh, highlight. Uh, basically, all the other uh, organs have similar regulations. You must have a Ministry of Health license to perform, in this case, liver transplantation. Only they have different levels of hospitals. The highest level is a 3A hospital, so you must be a 3A hospital. Um, you must have departments of surgery, gastroenterology, and I ICU. Uh, the facility requirements, you have to have more than 80 beds, 10 years of experience in hepatobiliary surgery, over 500 hepatobiliary or pancreatic uh, operations per year, and that you have to have a, a separate liver transplant OR and a liver transplant ward. Surgery requirements, three senior surgeons, uh, greater than 10 years of experience and five years, uh, greater than five years experience in liver transplantation, and the, the volume requirements as well. So you can see that those of us who are very familiar with, with requirements for CMS and for um, uh, UNOS, in general, they are in the same flavor uh, as those regulations. So how have they tried to enforce the regulations? As I mentioned before, there are issues regarding the rule of law and enforcement of, of any regulation in China. And uh, I, this slide is, is just documenting two, but there have been others with similar um, consequences. The vice minister was informed of two cases of transplant tourism back in 08. The response was after a full investigation that confirmed these, uh, these cases, each of the hospitals was uh, not allowed to perform the transplant that they uh, transplanted a, a transplant tourist on for a year. So uh, it found out at least uh, the, the penalties uh, are severe. The issue is once again um, how to kind of police that as they don't really have the manpower to do uh, um, uh, audits, UNOS you know, audits like we see here, or CMS audits, or even uh, an ability to track each organ that is, that is uh, procured at the current time. So um, uh, one of the issues is living donation. And um, as the number of, of organs from executed prisoners has decreased, the number of living donors has increased. The Ministry of Health does not officially uh, and, uh, condone or support uh, living donation, um, but it does um, 
uh, address it in regulation and has become uh, even uh, more uh, proscriptive than, uh, than the U.S. in this area in terms of who uh, should be uh, uh, accepted for donors, including uh, BMI, uh, hypertension, and anatomy issues that, that get down to uh, who uh, can and cannot be a living donor. And part of that is, is that the Ministry of Health uh, feels that China's legal, social, economic, and health systems are, are not yet mature enough to support living donation in the way that Western uh, countries have been able to support it. So these regulations were um, published in The Lancet uh, by uh, Jaifu, um, myself, and Ely Mao, uh, who is Jaifu's kind of right-hand uh, man, uh, back in 08. And then uh, soon after that, uh, the registry was uh, uh, formed, and um, the, the key people for the, for the registry are um, S.T. Fan here, and Haibo here. Um, both uh, uh, ST is a uh, uh, transplant surgeon in Hong Kong and a chairman of the Department of Surgery. And um, Haibo, um, I don't know what kind of physician he is, but he's also getting his Master's of Public Health currently in the States um, and has been instrumental in uh, developing and um, working with the registry to make it um, as efficient as possible. And it is a post-transplant registry, so Ministry of Health approved hospitals have to uh, provide information regarding their transplants uh, to the registry. And if you have access uh, to it, um, you can get your own uh, data. It is certainly not the same as a UNOS. Uh, those of us who in, in transplant, you know, we can go to to SRTR and find out not only your uh, stats, but stats for every other program that you in the, in the country, uh, it is not that robust. Um, it, is, it is not that transparent at the current time, something that uh, we'll certainly um, be working on. Um, but there's a lot, just as it was when the U.S. started that, there's a lot of apprehension of putting your own data out publicly. So brain death is, has been a, a big issue in, the, in Asia in general, and um, it has not been particularly um, effective or uh, embraced by any of the Asian uh, uh, cultures. That, however, didn't stop us from at least trying. Um, as we know that in, in the U.S. it's been the standard since, uh, since 69, it's the standard in Europe. Um, the, the primary criteria of establishing the etiology of the disease causing brain death, excluding other uh, potentially reversible syndromes, demonstrating clinical signs of brain death coma, brainstem reflexia, and apnea. And all of these uh, were, in fact, uh, generally accepted by the, this conference that I was at um, um, by the medical community, but um, because of issues regarding um, kind of the Ministry of Health, the Justice Ministry, etc. Uh, there was there was uh, no way to get a law passed, and so uh, we have, as of today, still uh, have failed in getting a brain death law uh, uh, happening in China. Uh, at the same time, I, I show this uh, so this at the same time that the brain death meeting was uh, occurring. Uh, I think a couple of days before, there was a meeting in the Chinese Organ Transplant Council. Um, I think I was been the only Westerner that has been a part of that, but that is not the significant part. The significant part is this this person here who's um, in military garb, and it was the first time, in fact, that the military had attended um, a Chinese Organ Transplant Council meeting, and that is significant because in China there are at least two different hospital systems. There's the Ministry of Health system, which is the larger, um, and then there's a military system, and the military system essentially has, uh, does, does not have to abide by the Ministry of Health uh, policies, rules, and regulations. And so uh, just by them joining uh, the organ transplant uh, council meeting uh, is at least a first step in the, the process of them understanding that hopefully they will um, get into a similar type of regulatory environment in the, in the future. So what do we do um, when we're trying to develop a citizen-based voluntary system uh, of organ donation without a brain death law? <clears throat> so 
Um, this is the standard Western and our current way of looking at the dece deceased donor pool. We have the blue ones, the brain death ones, and the, the salmon colored uh, that are depicting the donation of cardiac death, and we think of them as, as different groups, and we treat them uh, in a totally different manner um, in terms of their, their workup, the ethical underpinnings, etc. And um, when you don't have a, a brain death law, it's really hard to kind of move forward in a deceased donor uh, pool. So what we had to do was think of an innovative way to, uh, to reclassify things. And so what we did was we redefined uh, deceased uh, organ donation in China. And so now we have this whole pool, and we have uh, those blue donors who are brain dead donors, but we will treat them like the salmon, the uh, uh, donation after cardiac death donors. And that way, um, every donor will be treated the same way, just like a D uh, DCD donor. Some of them will be brain dead, but will not be necessarily classified uh, as brain dead. But they will obviously die more, more quickly than those that, in our traditional fashion of uh, looking at a donation after cardiac death. <clears throat> and so we, we uh, looked at this innovative way of, of redefining uh, deceased organ donation in China. We published that, in, once again, on a Lancet article <clears throat> in 2012, and also uh, noted that uh, we were going to begin a pilot project of, of, um, of donation utilizing these types of, of terms and processes. And so, uh, as I mentioned, we'll treat all uh, potential donors as DCDs, and uh, especially at first because, in fact, many of the uh, hospitals, ICUs, they would have brain dead donors just hanging around because they had nothing else that they could do with them. Uh, they couldn't take them off life support because that would be killing them because they weren't brain, they, they didn't have a brain death law even that they were brain dead. And so they just had these people um, taken up and, and at the brain death uh, meeting it was estimated that um, up to I think 10 percent of the health care costs um, in China were, were uh, programmed for these types of, of patients who were in ICUs just hanging out uh, as brain dead but not being able to, to do anything about them. And um, so we also wanted to establish a national or, or organ uh, donation system uh, with uh, an allocation system, et cetera, s moving towards uh, what would be closer to be considered, considered to be a, a Western type of, of, of scenario. So we were treating uh, everyone as a, as a DCD donor. Uh, the demonstration project ran from April of 11 to January of 12. And uh, 26 OPOs were utilized slash established. And 292 organs uh, went to 31 hospitals. And 50% were, were occurred in the last six months of the project. Um, an update from that is now that there's up to 546 organs from 207 donors in 16 regions. And the, the, for the first time under this system, uh, organs were actually allocated in a transparent way and a sharing policy was established. As I mentioned before previously, there was a one-to-one -one relationship between prisoners and hospitals, um, which uh, allowed the hospitals to, to transplant whoever they wished. And now there's, uh, there is a sharing policy and an allocation system. Um, if a um, donor was... A, uh, was identified in one of the transplant hospitals, um, th at least uh, the, the transplant hospital was guaranteed to get, to get at least one kidney out of that donor, similar to, to the early stages of, of UNOS, in which there was some feeling of propriety um, in, in uh, an organ and a donor within your organization. So the, uh, the essentially UNOS type of system, the China Organ Transplant Response System, was launched in April of, of 11. And uh, there were 26 OPOs, et cetera. And this is how they signed in. And there was uh, a, a de decision made on how to allocate and to prioritize uh, candidates with transparency. And this is how the system looks when you, when you open it up uh, with a donor. Uh, very similar to how we would see um, a donor and recipient characteristics with melds of 40 down to melds of 22, um, although in our uh, UNO systems they're not Chinese characters. 
So um, one of the aspects um, that uh, was truly remarkable at the uh, meeting that really um, uh, summarized the experience of the of the pilot project uh, was the a donor story. And although I've been to to China several dozens of times and spent uh, uh, anywhere from a couple of days to uh, to a month there at any, any one trip, I, I've learned very little Chinese. Um, I'm generally tone deaf, it's a tonal language, I'm terrible at languages, and I'm fortunate and they always are able to provide me with an interpreter, so the, the need is not there to, to learn either. But um, at this meeting with the donor story, you didn't need to know the language. Um, it's the same that we hear uh, from our own uh, donor stories with, this was a, a migrant worker who lost his son and was, um, fortunate enough in his, in his terms to be able to uh, allow his son to be a donor. I had always thought that um, the, the cities that, um, like Shanghai would be the leaders in developing a voluntary deceased donor program because the, the, there's a more youth-oriented uh, culture with uh, less reliance on the traditional cultures. Uh, but this was a man who, who in fact proved that wrong. He, like I said, he was a migrant worker. Um, of, of little means and um, uh, really uh, was very emotional in, in being able to provide his story and his, his, uh, his son's organs to other people. So um, some of the things that are, are moving on since then, um, there's a, uh, a manuscript in, in re under current review to utilizing ECMO and uh, Will and I were talking about ECMO and other uh, scenarios today, and um, they have started using ECMO uh, for their DCD. So uh, they they uh, pronounce someone dead after the usual five minutes, and then initiate ECMO in order to uh, improve the the um, the preservation uh, system of the organs while they're doing a uh, now more a more standard organ procurement. Uh, they were initially concerned that the heart might reanimate after uh, initiation of ECMO, but at least as of um, the last I spoke with them, they had not seen any reanimations of the heart uh, with ECMO, <coughs> and uh, that they are, um, uh, you know, worrying about it, whether to try to move up, go from five minutes to four minutes, but also the concern uh, that that w uh, would be in terms of reanimating the heart. So. Um, but this is a, a nice step in, in terms of trying to improve the quality of the organs that they receive from their donors. So let's kind of uh, encapsulate what uh, we've seen already in terms of social changes. When I first started going over to China and really talking about transplantation and thinking about their system, um, the general sense was not only from the physicians but even for, from uh, uh, people that I talked with, you know, cab drivers, etc., that there was nothing wrong with using executed prisoners as donors. Transplant tourism was good for the system, and that Chinese would never embrace living donor transplantation because they wanted to have their body whole uh, up until the time of burial. <clears throat> well, now in 2010, the government wants to eliminate the, de the death penalty, recognition that transplant tourism and payment for organs is unacceptable, living donation is increasing, and deceased donor uh, 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 donation is definitely on the agenda and being uh, uh, executed now in, a, in, in many projects. So this is just one of the, the many stories that are in the press in China. The idea of donating one kidney to my daughter had been uh, lingering with me for some time. And he was, you know, in the, in, in the new system, um, more willing and able to do that. A quote from Jaifu in, 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 in recent meetings, the evolution of organ transplant, transplantation provides one of the best windows through which to view contemporary Chinese society while it struggles uh, with the search for a cultural identity and late modernity. And that the, the deepest significance of organ transplantation lies in its gift exchange dimension, in the nature and magnitude of what is given, taken, and received. There's uh, a feeling that organ donation will help China in, in its uh, uh, constant quest for a harmonious society and that having a fair ethical uh, organ transplant uh, system is part and parcel to, to that harmonious society. So how have we done in the last six years? 
Uh, we've improved the quality of patients, so patients are not getting harmed by setting the standards for being a Ministry of Health approved transplant center. Transplantation's reputation is improving and that we're trying to address this, these problems and that's globally. China's Organ Transplant Committee has provided clinical guidelines regarding candidacy, perioperative and postoperative care. We've improved informed consent to the patients and donors, including the prisoner donors, and developed strategies and voluntary disease donor systems with transparent allocations. In terms of a social entrepreneur, I think that we're about halfway there to a sustainable social entrepreneurial success with entrepreneurship, innovation, and so, so, social change. What we need to accelerate it, I think number one is some time. Obviously funding, it's going to take a lot of money to really broaden this out and to extend the rule of law in China. And so our goals, my goals at least for the next five years in regarding this aspect is to make a voluntary disease donor program robust enough to eliminate the use of uh, prisoners as organ donors, improve uh, the enforcement of regulations, provide on-site audits of transplant activities, expand the policies and procedures to non-Ministry of Health hospitals such as the military hospital. So one of my goals, as, as you saw, was to eliminate the uh, need for, eliminate the use of, of donors uh, from executed prisoners. Well, so um, the recent um, notice from the Ministry of Health says that they want to eliminate uh, this uh, use of organs from prisoners in 2013. So in the year that, that, uh, that we are currently in, they want to eliminate it. And I hi highlight uh, Haibo, Haibo's name here, uh, who's uh, quoted uh, significantly in this article, so that um, we really see that this is a, 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 a truly a, a Chinese uh, effort. I have, I think, provided some assistance, counseling, guidance, and consultation to the Ministry of Health as well as others in order to try to, to um, guide them through both their own issues as well as the issues uh, in terms of international acceptance. Um, Frank Delmonico, who was our first speaker in this series, um, at, 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 at sometimes has been very vocal and animated regarding um, the use of, of uh, and the whole the use of executed prisoners in the whole transplant system in China and uh, kind of maneuvering through all of uh, those types of, of uh, concerns and critics and still keeping China on a path that is sustainable um, at times has been a challenge and many phone calls to, to all people. Uh, but uh, I'm really encouraged at the process that China has gone through and the progress that they are making and will continue to make. So once again, Mark, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Mike. Um, the, the paper is open for questions. I'm going to ask Dr. Chapman. Would you introduce yourself as you start, please? Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Will Chapman. I'm a transplant surgeon at Washington University in St. Louis and head up the transplant center and abdominal transplant programs there. Um, Mike, that's a great summary of the problems that have existed. One, um, one area I'd be curious about for you to comment on is the uh, term transplant tourism and the elimination and punishment of centers that have been um, that have engaged in any transplant tourism. I guess I'd like you to define it a little more because I'd have to say we practice transplant tourism very commonly. In fact, uh, centers work to have transplant tourism in the U.S. We think it's good. And you know, the United Network for Organ Sharing has established that you can have as much transplant tourism for living donation as you like you're restricted to 5% of your transplant volume um, annually for cadaveric donation. There's some really busy centers, there's some not so busy, but I've never had the view that that was um, something that shouldn't be done in the United States. So, right. So I think that's it's a it's an excellent point, and I, I've had that you know that same concern um, regarding transplant tourism and and how we allow it here and it's um, banned in, in China. And I, I think that the, the, the difference is that when patients go to China to get an organ, um, they are paying a broker a lot of money. Um, Would they have to? Yes. 
That's the that has been the system. Now, yes, I mean, in in a different system in which there is not payment for organs, then I think you you'd at least have to readdress <coughs> the the concept of whether transplant tourism is allowable or not. But where in the U.S. there is no difference, so there's it, when WashU and the University of Chicago performs a a transplant on someone who specifically came to the U.S. for their transplant, they are getting charged the same amount, their, at least their charged bill, as any other patient in the U.S. In China, that is not true. They, the, the foreigners are charged more. In addition to, they are paying for an organ. And I think those two differences um, make the ethical practice of transplant tourism in China a real challenge right now. Um, if we were 10 years, 15 years, whatever, um, in the future and the payment of organs has gone away in China, there's a transparent system, all that other stuff, then I think at least we can readdress it. Um, you know, if, if we were to fully um, utilize the potential of deceased donors in China, it would probably overwhelm currently the number of patients who can at least in, afford transplantation in China. And so then you'd have to think of, well, what, what should you do with those organs? Um, you know, should the government, you know, provide more insurance to get, allow more Chinese people to get organs, or should you open that up to transplant tourism? I think that those are reasonable things to think about 10 or 15 years from now. How did Vice Minister Wang do in the recent reshuffling? He, he did fine. Um, so the, there is a mandatory retirement age of 65. And similar to what I talked about with the, the rule of law, that doesn't apply. Uh, Jaifu is 70 or so, I think, uh, something like that, certainly over 65. Um, and the, in, the pre, the, in the previous power uh, shift before the most recent one, uh, they also, the, the, one of the ways they got around the Ministry of Health, uh, the governmental um, age restriction was is that they they define him as the personal physician for all the, the leaders. And so I think that that continues. Um, and uh, he has continued to be a vice minister even with the, the new uh, power shift. Wow, lots of questions. Well, Mark came with the microphone first. Um, perhaps I'm a little dense, but I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding your blue and the salmon with the cardiac death and being ready. Do they uh, pre-line these people ready to go get on ECMO? Yes. And so how, how do they anticipate that? I mean, how much, there must be a lot of manipulation there as to who's going to have a cardiac death. Tell me who, you know, if you can predict within... No, no, no. Hour, so, so, it? it's, so it's just as a, in that system, it's just the, way, the same way that we do it, right? Is, is that someone, um, you know, is on life support, is, has no chance of survival, da-da-da. So the organ procurement organization goes to the family and says, would you like to, to be able to provide organs for donation? Mm -hmm. And they say yes, and they, so they, they withdraw life support, okay? And once the heart stops for five minutes, they're declared dead. So, but if there's no brain dead, how do they, they're allowed, still allowed to withdraw life yeah. support? Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. And, then, and then once, they, once their heart stops, then they're declared dead. So before you do that, you line them up yeah. with the ECMO. Yeah, yeah. But it sounds like a little, Manipulation as far as if it's not really brain dead, you're still disconnecting. And well, there, there, are, there are patients who have been identified as, as, and their families have identified that they want to withdraw life support. Do you have an EEG on one of these individuals with ECMO? Uh, no. Really well, in, the EEG wouldn't make it a difference in China. There's no brain death. They're basing it on the cessation of uh, circulatory well, function. Right. Sure. Yeah, Mike, as a declared uh, social uh, entrepreneur now, and uh, with some of the successes that you've had in um, China, um, I'm curious as to what you intend to do next, uh, since uh, issues related to transplant tourism and all of those uh, issues actually prey on the uh, unexploited uh, vulnerable populations. 
Um, since you are so close to India, have you ventured to actually look I, at I, I, I've never been to there? India. I, I, India is far away from China, actually. <laughs> but there are a lot of vulnerable populations in between the two, too. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, you know it, it does come, you know, I thought actually the elimination of executed prisoners would pretty much take the rest of my professional career. And so I'm really amazed at, at how quickly it seemingly has, has coming around. And so it does uh, bring up the issue of, well, what am I going to do next? Uh, I think there's still a lot to do in China. And, and I want to continue to, to work in that area. I'm open to, to looking at other areas as well. Um, uh, I, I think that the experience has been a learning experience, and, um, and I, it's very gratifying that it's moving along so quickly. If I'm going to raise two, I hope, controversial issues. Uh, that's the intent. Um, the first is about the use of ECMO to prepare um, a donor for donation post cardiac death. Um, as it's practiced in China, do they prevent cerebral re blood flow? Or as it's done in the United States, do we prevent cerebral re blood flow? My understanding, my understanding for in both of those scenarios is that they do not. So there's no no blockage of it, but, right. there, but there's also no retesting of whether or That's not. That's correct. That's my understanding. So I just, I'm you know, as far as I know, what, there's a, a balloon catheter that's put in the aorta to right. prevent reflow to the heart, but right. not uh, flow to the brain. And that's how this is, is practiced in the U.S. Yeah. and in some areas of Europe. So uh, I think it's the same. Yeah. Okay. The, the second has to do with the, the second issue has to do with the somewhat um, I'm going to label it disingenuous stance that uh, transplant tourism is practiced in a wide open, completely transplant me mechanism in the United States. Um, while I am certainly part of it, uh, we must recognize the fact that there is, while there may not be a difference in charges established for transplants for foreign visitors, there is certainly a difference in revenue generated. No question about it's that. A huge difference. Huge difference. So that individual programs may survive on doing as few as one foreign national on an annual basis because that's the difference between losing money and, and making money. Mm -hmm. Can you comment further on that? Yeah. So uh, I, I, there, that's absolutely true. Um, it uh, and there's more transparency coming uh, in terms of transplant tourism with UNOS you know, regulations requiring public um, dissemination of the number of transplant uh, that you've done on, on, on patients that are non-U.S. nationals. Uh, so there's more transparency in the numbers. Um, in terms of the, the uh, financial aspect, you're absolutely right. Programs get a lot more money um, from doing transplant tourism than they do for doing pa transplants on Medicaid patients. No question about it. Or Medicare, or any other private payer, yes. But the charges are the same. Charges are the same. So, Mike, I wonder if you tell us a little bit more about your own personal story of like how you got from being, you know, professor at University of Chicago to uh, advising the Chinese government, and maybe what lessons you've learned about how to be effective in that situation, and maybe, you know, pitfalls to avoid. Yeah. So. Um, Repeat the question. Yeah. Well, uh, so so I think that the, this got that right. So the question is, how did I get involved in? Uh, moving from a uh, professor of surgery at the University of Chicago to, uh, uh, to advising the Ministry of Health and doing this and then how um, kind of some lessons about why I've been so successful perhaps. So um, I, I, my first um, experience with uh, China and transplantation was a, um, a self-preservation experience. Um, I was uh, a fellow at UCLA, and we were doing 250 liver transplants a year, and I was the only fellow. And um, so um, CM Lowe, who is ST Fan's junior person, um, came over for a year starting in January of, of my first year of my fellowship. And as bad as the first year of the fellowship was going to be, the second year of the fellowship was going to be worse. Um, <laughs> Because uh, during the second year of the fellowship, you go out on all the procurements with the, the first year fellow and teach them how to procure. And 
um, I was going to have to go out every night with the, with the first year fellow, and that was going to be just a, a killer. Um, and so when, when CM Lowe came over for a year, starting in January, my uh, first order of business for self-preservation was to teach him how to procure so that he could go out some of the nights with the first year fellows instead of me. And so CM Lowe and I became very close, and then he went back to Hong Kong after he finished and helped uh, S.T. Fan with the liver transplant program there. And uh, he would invite me over fairly frequently to Hong Kong, and I started, you know, not only going to Hong Kong, but uh, to some areas of China, giving talks and all that, as I said, not doing transplants. Um, and uh, so I got fairly familiar with the transplant system there and many of the transplant surgeons. And then, um, and then in the 06 time period, and Mark will know this very well, um, Roy Schwartz, who at that time was the head of the China Medical Board and also the head of the visiting committee of the dean uh, of the University of Chicago here, um, was talking with, with Jai Fu regarding uh, the need uh, for um, transplant reform in China. And um, Jai Fu agreed and, um, and they said, we all, they said that they needed a U.S. partner to help them with and so Roy being uh, on the visiting committee here um, uh, said, well, you know, we've got a great transplant program at the University of Chicago, why don't you talk with, with them? And um, it was through then that uh, relationship that I got involved and um, helped write the grant ultimately to get, uh, they got China Medical Board funding and then the, the uh, uh, renewal in, in, in 11. And so um, it was through that specific relationship. Um, the broader picture of that relationship is, is that uh, Jai Fu, in, a bit, in addition to being Vice Minister of Health, is also head of the uh, liver surgery um, uh, section at Peking Union Medical College, which is um, the most prestigious uh, and best medical school in China. And that PUMC was established by Rockefeller, um, which the China Medical Board was as well, and obviously the University of Chicago. So we all have uh, Rockefeller roots as well. So I think that helped cement a relationship. And um, so how I've been successful, I think that for one thing is, is that we, you always have to recognize that um, it's not about you. It's about them and, and getting them to improve. And um, I think that, um, I think your question about being a professor is, is, is really important. I'm not sure that an assistant professor could do that because an assistant professor is looking at a ways to promote his career um, and would probably look at that more. How am I, you know, can I be a first author? Can I be a last author? Can I do this? Can I, you know, get this published, et cetera? And having already been a professor, it was less important for me to feel that any of these specific steps along the way were attributed to me but the fact that I really wanted to help China and to be a social entrepreneur and get, it, get that established. And so um, it, al it always has to, to be a Chinese um, initiative. It has to have Chinese roots and a Chinese flavor. Um, my, my contribution has been to, to make sure that they understand what's ethically acceptable, um, how to maneuver from sometimes Frank's extreme thoughts and, and um, comments about um, uh, the executed prisoners and payment for organs and this and that and the other and um, where they want to go and to try to find that, that ground that doesn't hit the third rail on either side. I, I know there are, there are more questions, but I always think that that, that answer is an is, um, effective place to, to stop. I, I mean, it, it is quite remarkable uh, as you think about um, how much you and JFU and the Chinese transplant programs have accomplished and changed in six or seven years um, to think about moving a, a major system in the largest uh, population base in the world uh, in a relatively short time. Um, and even though there are still critics out there, um, like, like Frank, um, Laney mentioned Art Kaplan's article, um, yes. in which he doesn't think anything has changed. Um, 
I, I, I think things are, are really um, different now from when you started. Um, of, of course, in a very selfish way, I, I think your background in ethics, um, you know, beginning with the Brolsch program here and um, including that uh, critique of um, living donors for um, uh, right uh, hepatectomies in the New England Journal in 2000, um, ga gave you a certain perspective on, on some of the ethical problems that are associated with, um, with, with Chinese transplant policy before you, before you and Jay Fu began to work. Of course, having an, a, a helper like Jay Fu, who, uh, who's safe and secure in, in the Chinese system, was fabulous. Yes. Well, I, I want to thank you. It was a fabulous <coughs> talk. Thank you. Thank you.